Hi, everybody, and welcome to the women's game. This is the third of three preview podcasts. Raj, we made it. Yeah, this is the episode where we get the medals at the end, right? Well, so. I can promise you that this will be in the top three episodes of this preview pod series. Oh, bite your arm off for the top three. Unlike Hillary Mantle book series and Boy Genius, the best things always come in threes. Honestly, bite your arm off for a bronze. <laughs> hey, we're on the podium. But if you haven't heard the first two episodes in which we preview the U.S. Women's National in Group B and discuss Group A, go back and listen to those on our pod feed. All of this is brought to you by our friends at Allstate, who we love so much. They're doing so much good for soccer in this country. But today's podcast is going to feature Group C. I'll talk about Group C in one quick second, because C is for content. Sammy, but you mentioned the word podium. What was it like actually standing on a podium? Are you aware in that moment that you remember standing on the podium for your whole life? Or are you just like, I'm on the podium, but I'm not on the top part of the podium, and I, Sam Lewis, am thoroughly PO'd? Yeah, our podium moment was super unique. So we had to go to the gold medal match. Um, it was really, really hot in Japan. We had to wear masks. Um, we had on these presentation white suits that were for the metal stand is what they were called. And it was really cool and really special. But I just remember me and Christy had the giggles up there and there's all of us <laughs> kind of standing in this one long straight line. And we had bouquets of flowers and we had our medals. And in all the pictures, I'm kind of just like chuckling a little bit. And I kind of wish I had taken it a little more seriously. <laughs> and there's Becky Sauerbrun looking down at a bronze medal and saying to herself, hmm, they gave me a new drinks coaster. And see, <laughs> it is for coasters, Sam. Well, it should be for champions, Raj, because this group, Group C, <laughs> features current FIFA number one ranked team, defending World Cup champions, Spain, La Roja, as well as three other really historically accomplished teams. We're talking Japan. Former World Cup winners from 2011. Nadi Shiko, Japan. We also have Nigeria. A nine-time AFCON winner, the mighty Super Falcons. And we have Marta's Brazil. Yeah, Copa American Feminina winners. I guess they're the martyrs. <laughs> the Carajinhas. Oh, that is an amazing drink and an equally amazing football team. Sammy, I will never stop asking you uh, about your own national team glory. You represented our United States in every single major tournament, including that 2019 World Cup win and your 2020 Olympics that we just talked about. You brought home that bronze medal. Um, this run up to the Olympics, it's such a massive moment for all these footballers. What are they feeling in this moment as they charge towards it, all of that football to play, but knowing they're Olympian? What was your experience? Yeah, I think that the run up to the Olympics, it really is all consuming, especially in those months before when you're just so desperate to get named to that tiny, tiny roster. <laughs> so this is our third episode of this pod, Raj. And so this is when we start to get a little bit off script here. So I want to tell you actually a story. But when I was training for the 2016 Olympics, I had only been a professional for one year. I was home in the Boston area in the off season. So it was the winter. It must have been like January or February of 2016. And I got jury duty. And I remember dreading it because I was like, if I get picked for jury duty as like this 23-year-old hopeful Olympian, what am I going to do if I can't train for a couple of weeks because I have to go to jury duty? So I show up to jury duty. I'm sitting there. I'm so anxious. And all I can think about is like, what is Jill going to think if I have to call her and say, I can't do my training? What is Don Scott going to think if I don't get the numbers in zone five that I need to get today? I was so stressed, Raj, that when I got called up to talk to the judge so that they could see if I was like capable of handling jury duty. If I, you were, you know, mentally fit. I started crying. And I, <laughs> I, I was 23 years old. I wanted to make the Olympics so bad. I started crying and I said to the judge, I'm so sorry. I don't think that I can do this. I'm trying to make the Olympics and I have to train. And I like to think that the judge was like, that's really important. You do have to train. You go train for the Olympics. You're dismissed. But I think the judge was like, this girl's crying in court. Like she can't do it. So get her out of here. And I'm a little bit embarrassed about the story, but I do think it sheds light on the mindset of an Olympian how important it is for them to train every single day in the build-up to the games. 
And by the way, of thousands of listeners to this show, when they're now called up um, for jury duty of all shapes and sizes, I know I, I may try it. Just look at the judge sincerely, then start sobbing and just say, I'm an Olympic athlete in training and see if it works for you. I'm going to tell oh the my. next judge I'm a decathlete. But Sammy, <laughs> let's get back to the football. Let's get back to this group. Yeah. Three of these teams are ranked in the top 10. It is a lethal uh, just group packed with challenge, danger, wonder. Um, the gold medal winner may well come from this group. I've got a feeling it's just the two of us talking here. What are your first impressions? Well, Raj, is the gold medal winner going to come from this group? It's a really good question. These groups are all really good. I know I keep saying this, but I am going to sidestep your question a little bit. This group has the potential to be the most entertaining group. Spain are so technically sound. They basically have paintbrushes for feet. Then we have this spatially intelligent and this deadly in transition Nigeria. Japan is a team looking to return their nation to past glories. And then Brazil are just 18 footballers who are basically putting on a show with like Beyonce's style and Taylor Swift's heart. I think when you describe it like that, it sounds like a style that should be technically known as sequins football. I literally love that so love much. It. I'm obsessed. But let's get in the Raj. Let's start with La Roja, Spain. Oh, who just beat France 2-0 to win their first ever Women's Nations League. Um, French captain Wendy Renardo, we talked about in the last episode, she called the Spanish the team to beat at these Olympics. Um, and what Spain have achieved has been remarkable, something we should not normalise. They've become the gold standard of women's football, technically, tactically, mentally, um, even more so when you consider the off-field distractions that they've had to grapple with, face and overcome. Uh, it's impossible to forget the player protest against then-coach Jorge Vilda uh, before the World Cup, which prompted 15 players, 15 players, to temporarily stand down from national team duty. Um, and then Spain still only went and won that World Cup win, but it was immediately overshadowed by darkness after then Spanish Football Federation president Luis Rubiales non consent Essentially kissed attacker Jenny Hermoso on the medal stand. Rubiales has since been banned from football for three years. He'll actually go on trial next February in Spanish courts. Uh, these are all horrible scenes. Um, and it's led to a protracted fight to reform the country's football federation. Um, the players can now focus so solely on this tournament. The iconic Alexia Puteas, quite painfully but brilliantly, I thought, said, we are footballers, but we have had to get it into our heads that sometimes we can't just be footballers. Sam, I mean, watching all of this, we we unpackaged it in real time, uh, agonizingly during the World Cup coverage. Um, and you were involved in the US women's own fight for equal pay. Take us back to that moment as you've watched this one. What did you have to do to not just handle the pressure on the field, um, but also to grapple behind the scenes mentally? How do you just turn it on when you actually, actually fight in game? Yeah, I mean, we what meant the most, I think, to us in our situation was staying united. It, our situation was really like a labor issue. And if there were any cracks in our chain, if anyone crossed the picket line or expressed doubt about what we were doing, the whole thing really would have crumbled. So I feel like the lesson that I learned was that you really are stronger as a collective. And it made me really grateful for unions and labor laws that are meant to protect employees. Um, those laws that we have here in America are really important. But when I think about this Spanish team, I really feel for these players. They've consistently been put in really difficult situations by their leadership, their federation, their coach. And I commend them for being able to perform so incredibly well on the field, despite all of this chaos off of it. They must be great at just compartmentalizing those challenges um, of facing this difficulty off the field, facing this difficulty with their federation, but then taking a moment to refocus and recenter themselves and come together on the field to play the beautiful football that they've been playing. And it is beautiful football, but incredibly, this is actually the first time Spain have qualified for the Olympics. Um, and this squad, when you look at it, you see so much individual talent, um, but you also know 
just how well they click together and perform as a collective. Um, just one loss on this entire calendar year. Um, so much familiarity across this squad. 12 members play for either Real Madrid or that dominant Barcelona uh, team. I don't know how you say buzzsaw in Catalan, but this, this Barcelona side have won five straight Liga F titles back-to-back Champions Leagues. Uh, just another level of football. Um, they feel two-time Ballon d'Or winner um, and Barcelona's all-time leading goal scorer, Alexia Puteas. Current Ballon d'Or holder, Aitana Bonmati. Spain also has 20-year-old sensation, Salma Paraluelo, our all-state player to watch, who scored 20 goals last season in 19 league appearances uh, at Barcelona. She may be the only player in the tournament who's actually been profiled by Runners World. I crap you not before focusing on football she set five under 18 Spanish records as a sprinter and a hurdler honestly it takes me longer to tie my shoes and it takes her to run 400 meters Sam when you look at all of these human beings all these incredible stories all these incredible footballers who are you most excited about watching who do you expect to have an impact Raj the player that I actually want to talk about is one who wasn't even at the World Cup last summer it's Barcelona's Patri Guijarro she was one of 15 players who made the decision not to play for Spain to protest that now disgraced Spanish manager Jorge Vilda. But guess what? Vilda's out and Guijaro is back. And not only is she a moral compass on this team, she's also a midfield metronome. She's a defensive shield and a leader who makes all those around her better. And this is the type of player I think every team needs in order to win a major competition. I cannot wait to see her back on the world stage. Next up, Japan, who bought their trip to Paris by beating North Korea 2 on an aggregate prompting Japanese captain Saki Kumagai to say, quote, I felt like we had to win for the future of women's football. And I'll let the team know that before the game. I love watching this team play. They really are just a delight because they're equal parts skill and sheer utter fearlessness. I like watching someone effortlessly just casually juggle a set of state knives coming off an impressive World Cup. They sort of rinse eventual winners, Spain 4-0 in the group stage. That game, you know, we remember the goals, we remember the victory um, but it's really important to know it tells you a lot about this team they only had 23% possession in that game um, and then they advanced to the quarterfinals before quite I mean they were shocked when they fell to Sweden Japan have been steadily gaining momentum for the past few years I think they really rebuilt before that Tokyo Olympics as the host nation and now those young players that were gaining experience are really hitting their stride I think in the past, we both would have gone on and on about how difficult it is playing against Japan with their technical passing. And that's still true, but they've adjusted a little bit. They have this element to their game that's more direct. That game where they beat Spain at last summer's World Cup, they won on the counterattack. They were springing players in behind, finishing these lethal shots. It's a really dangerous idea that Japan could play both that beautiful technical passing style of football and this counterattack transition style of football, each style as ruthless as the last. Let's talk about Nigeria. And it's such a joy to talk about that team who are back in the Olympics for the first time since 2008, which means 37-year-old goalkeeper Tuchugu Oluwehi is the only player on the roster who's experienced this competition before. The Super Falcons have six-time African Women's Footballer of the Year, Asisa Oshwala, who moved from Barcelona to arrive on our shores at Bay City at the beginning of this season. She scored on a debut. Uh, the team has Africa's goalkeeper of the year, Chemaka Nade who going back to the start of last season's World Cup has kept nine clean sheets in the last 12 games as a teen. She actually considered becoming an accountant, but decided to, quote, give it until she was 20 to see if she could make it as a footballer. Sam, you've recently spoken to another player who is human, really remarkable, who we both admire so much, Michelle Alozzi. Michelle Alozzi is such an incredible human being. She was a guest on Friendlies earlier this year. She actually works as a cancer researcher at Texas Children's Hospital while playing for the Houston Dash. You should definitely go back and listen to the whole interview, but here's a little snippet of Michelle talking about her Nigeria team. I think it's like our like we will die in front of the net. And I think like after talking to some of my friends on Canada um, and on Ireland too, they're like, Michelle, you guys defend the box like your whole entire life depends on it, you know? <laughs> and so like people like you can see like Christy Uchibe like throwing her body in front of the box. Like you see people making these crazy diving headers, like doing these like 
one millisecond um, tackles that like could be a PK, but they're just like trusting <laughs> that they'll get there. Like, I think it's just like the, they are like, they're like, Nigerians are so prideful. And so I think we take that with us in every aspect. And so it's like, you guys, like, you might keep the ball for like 90%, like amazing, but like you will not score on us. Like, I think like that kind of mentality, like we're so prideful and like keeping a clean sheet. I think that makes it really difficult to play against us. Nigeria has some other familiar faces for NWSL fans, including Uchenna Kanu of Racing Louisville and Nicole Payne of the Portland Thorns. And they're coached by former Houston Dash head coach, multitasking expert Randy Waldrum, who is also (laughs) currently the head coach at Pitt. Randy's been an advocate for these players and has coached them to some incredible performances, including their tight, tight loss in penalty kicks to England at last summer's World Cup in the round of 16. Before the World Cup, Waldrum said that the Nigerian Football Federation owed him 14 months of back pay. He also told the On the Whistle podcast that he would have quit this job long ago, but for the players. To the last team of this group and the last of our preview episodes. And we've, I wouldn't say we said the best till last, um, but they are utterly magnificent. Brazil, who are trying to win their first Olympic medal in 16 years. They won silver in 2008. Also looking for their first tournament win outside South American soil, which is a fact that almost sounds impossible to be true a bit like learning that sharks have existed for longer than trees but yes so far brazil's biggest wins have come at the copa american femininas which have won eight of the last nine times it's been held this will also be the final tournament for the quite legendary um iconic uh, transcendent martyr Um, a remarkable human being who made her international debut for Brazil's under-20 team 22 years ago. That was back in 2002 when InSync had just broken up. Oasis was still buzzing, still together. Nothing could go wrong for them. But Sam, like almost everybody uh, who we are excited to watch in this tournament, Marta was recently a guest on Friendly. She sure was. Speaking with Marta was such an honor. I think... What really comes through when you talk with her is her mentality. I thought that the way she spoke about her role on this Brazil team was actually fascinating. She's encouraged so many of her Brazilian teammates to really try to challenge themselves in their club environments so that they can better perform for Brazil at the international level. She also said this. She spoke about how she's challenging them to take her spot. I talk a lot with them, you know. Uh, I be like very honest with them. Like I say, I want to play, but if you do better than me, I'm going to see it and then applaud you because you, you know, you deserve, but you need to, you need to work hard for that. Otherwise I'm going to keep playing and then you're going to sit on the bench. And then what I'm trying to show the girls, you are here because you deserve You know, no, because like you are, you are a young player and then uh, they, they want to renew the team. They look for new generation. No, you are here because you deserve, you did so well in your club. That's why they call you for the national team. So be you, you know, do your best because if you do your best, you're going to make me do my best. I'm going to make the other players do their best. And then together we're going to be strong. That's it. Marta is incredible. She Listening to him and that show in particular makes you feel like everything's possible if you just put your mind to it. I honestly feel like I could even grow my hair back if she told me I could. Uh, but they were grouped at last summer's World Cup. Brazil parted ways with coach Pia Sundhager uh, and a 4-4-2. They brought in Sao Paulo-born Arthur Elias, who's made some surprising choices. Let's just say that on the Olympic roster. Cho- less who is there let more who isn't Kansas City current midfielder Dabinia was not chosen for this squad even though she played in both of Brazil's friendlies against Jamaica last month um, and he also brought in Carolyn the reigning NWSL MVP uh, but a player who hasn't taken the field at all for the Carolina Courage this season because she's rehabbing from a, a cruel ACL injury what, what do you make of all this quite chaotic selection Sammy? Yeah I mean I these feel like two different issues to me I mean for start I love Caroline. She's an incredible attacker, reigning NWSL MVP. I really hope that she is physically ready to play at this tournament. 
Tearing your ACL is a journey, and I would usually err on the side of caution in terms of waiting a little longer to come back to competition, especially at this level. But I'm rooting for Caroline. I hope that we see her thriving on the field for Brazil. She's right around that nine-month mark, so um, hopefully her rehab has all gone smoothly and she's ready to go. Caroline aside, I think it's so absurd to not include Dubinia. Like, I, I, I feel like I'm missing something. Dubinia's been one of the best players in the world for the past five or six years, and... I can't really make sense of it by saying that the coach wanted to include more younger players to prepare for maybe the 2027 World Cup being in Brazil because there are plenty of veterans on this roster. So I actually truly feel like I'm missing something here with this decision, and I wish for all of our sakes that we would see Dabinia at the Olympics. Brazil are another team that the United States has faced recently. Um, We beat Brazil 1-0 in the CONCACAF W Gold Cup final back in mid-March. What do you remember from that game, that side back then? Yeah, Brazil created a ton of chances in that game. They were actually really impressive despite losing to the U.S. I was at that game in person, and I thought we were pretty fortunate to come away with the win. Brazil, overall, is a really fun team to watch. I love the way the game always opens up when they're playing. They've been playing with their left back, getting really high, forming almost a box midfield, and they love to create numbers up situations, but they're also all such incredible 1v1 attackers, so skillful, and with players like Marta, Adriana, and Gabby Nunez in the attack, they're going to have tons of goal-scoring threats. The one thing that I'll say about Brazil is that their discipline and game management has been an issue in the past, and this was really evident in their game against France at the World Cup. They... they they then let their chances of advancing slip away by tying Jamaica. So I think in order for Brazil to send Marta off on a high, we'll need to see a composure and a strategy that they haven't necessarily had in years past. Okay, it is prediction time, Sammy. I'm going to go Spain and Japan from this group, but let me ask you, who have you got? Yeah, I think Spain are the obvious front runners. Any reigning World Cup champion, I think we're all pretty confident that they're going to get out of their group, probably in first place. But I am going to keep bringing this up. We've already mentioned it a few times on this show. Japan did beat them last year in the third game of the World Cup group stage. They were all, Spain was already through, uh, but Italy were actually also able to beat them in December in the UEFA Nations League. So my point is, it is not impossible to beat Spain. So I guess I'm going Spain, Japan, and Brazil in third. I also do really kind of want success for Brazil. Um, I think sending Marta out on a high would be fun for the whole world. And I also, I see Nigeria as another one of those teams that could ruin everybody's day. I think this group, Group C, might actually be the hardest one. So far, just to recount the accounting on the who's coming through, Sammy, I think you've got all 12 I think, teams yeah. progressing from the group stage. I think You're I so have nice all 12 everyone. teams actually winning gold medals. <laughs> Which brings us to the big question. Spoiler alert. Who is going to win it all? I mean, obviously the United States women, um, but in a parallel universe, Sam, if not them, who will be standing atop the dais in Paris in the Parc de Prince Stadium? The best prince since Wonder Woman on Saturday, August 10th. It's such an obvious answer, Raj. I can't imagine anybody beating Spain, I except maybe Japan in the group stage. Um, Spain are a clear front runner for me. I think after that, I feel like I'd, I'd probably go Japan. I really feel like this Japan team has been brewing something for a while. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to see, seeing especially how this group C shapes up because it has a lot of favorites in it. I also can't see anyone clipping Spain. They're just so brilliant. Uh, on the ball, their decision making, uh, their collective team into play, their touch on the ball, their tactical prowess. It, it is light years away from the pack. Um, and just as it was in the lesser men's Euros, I expect to see Spain lift another trophy. Um, honestly, there's so much that we can learn from them. But again, to be clear, that's just my brain talking. My heart, as ever, says go, go USA. Well, thanks for clarifying that, Raj, because my heart is screaming go USA. <laughs> but this brings us, sadly, to the end of our preview pods. <sighs> Deep breath. This preview pod covered Group C, but if you're living your life in non-alphabetical order like we are, make sure you go back and listen to the other episodes with Groups B and A. And don't forget that the Olympics kicks off July 25th with all 12 teams playing throughout the day on the East Coast. Pretty incredible game times compared to last year is 1.45 a.m. alarm that I had set more than once, Raj. Oh, Sammy, I've loved doing this with you. I've learned so much from you. Little green bag and some stompers. 
um, LAZ, um, and also obviously Law and Order SUV does not exist. Um, not yet. And, uh, not yet, it doesn't. Somebody's listening to this and pitching it to the networks. Uh, but most of all, to listen to you is to learn about football, Sam. And who needs sleep when you got football? You're telling me. Uh, we are going to be dropping a lot more Olympics coverage and getting a lot less sleep for you all throughout this tournament. After these three preview podcasts, we're going to have pre-game podcasts before each USA match. We're also going to be going live at the final whistle of each USA game. So to make sure that you don't miss anything, make sure you're subscribed to this podcast feed, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can follow us across social media at Women's Game MIB. And you can even send me an email at Women's Game MIB at meninblazers.com. Raj, thank you so much for carrying the team through these preview podcasts with me. Uh, Sam, I was just an old turner. You are incredible. I love listening to you every single second. To you, to more, to the United States of America. Let's go, USA!